everybody. My name is Brent. You're listening to the LJS Podcast. This is episode number 12. Uh, I'm really excited today because on today's show, we've got my, one of my personal musical heroes of all time. That is jazz guitarist Peter Bernstein. I had an awesome talk with him um, at the New School for Jazz and Contemporary Music here in New York City uh, this week. And, 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 I, and I can't wait to share with you this amazing conversation we had, and I'm so grateful that we got to have Peter on the show today. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to say all this awesome music that you're listening to on today's show is by our guest, Peter Bernstein. This is off his new record, Let Loose. That's available on Smoke Session Records, and you can find this record on Amazon.com or iTunes. Uh, just look up Let Loose by Peter Bernstein. Um, and, and buy the album. This is an incredible album. I have to tell you, uh, I've listened to it. I've bought it. So good. So good. So definitely check out that music there. And before we go any further, though, I want to say one more thing. And that is if you got value out of today's show, consider adding value back. This podcast is 100% funded by listeners like you. So if you're on the website right now, there's a support button below the player. You can leave us a one-time or monthly donation to support this podcast. And if you're not on the website, you can go to www.learnjazzstandards.com slash support and you can support this podcast there. We really, really appreciate all your help in keeping this podcast going. And 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 wow, Peter Bernstein. What 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 can I what can I say? I mean, Peter Bernstein is he's one of my favorite jazz guitarists. He's one of my, forget about jazz guitar. He's one of my favorite jazz musicians. Um, incredibly lyrical, beautiful player. Uh, he's one of he's one of the biggest players on the scene today. So uh, to get him for to sit down and talk with me was was amazing. It was great. Uh, so I know you're gonna love you're gonna love today's show. Uh, and a little story before we start. So, you know, we finally set up this, this talk, uh, and, uh, you know, I caught him in between tours and all this stuff. And, and so I, we decided to meet at the new school for jazz and contemporary music, uh, it, you know, down in the village in New York city. Uh, so I go down there, I, I bring all my recording gear. I, I, you know, I lug it all in my backpack. Uh, I get there and, and, and I set up and, and all of a sudden, you know, has this ever happened to you? You know, you're, you know, everything that always works fine until you actually need it. So my, my editing, so my, my recording software crashes and, you know, we only have a limited time to record the podcast before he has to go teach a lesson to somebody. So, you know, what, what does one do when they get Peter Bernstein to sit down and, and give a talk, but your recording stuff crashes? Well, we recorded it on an iPhone. We went back in time and and decided to record on an iPhone. So, you know, sometimes things don't always work out perfectly when you want them to. But regardless, uh, I, I got this talk all recorded on iPhone. So if you're listening and you're like, that doesn't sound like all the other interviews on this podcast that I've listened to. Well, it's because it was recorded on an iPhone. But uh, nonetheless, uh, wow, what a great talk. What a great interview. Uh Peter talks about a lot of things, and, and I know you're going to get a lot out of this. So uh, without further ado, let's join in on our talk with Peter Bernstein. All right, so today I'm joined by guitarist Peter Bernstein, one of my personal musical heroes, so I'm very honored to have him today. Thanks for joining us on the show, Peter. Thank you for having me, Brent. Appreciate it. So we're in the, uh, the new school for jazz and contemporary music right now. Uh, now this place is, uh, it, it actually means something to you because you, you went to school at this institution, was it the late 80s or... It was. It was uh, 88, 89, and yeah, part of, of 90, I was there. So uh, yeah, kind of the, the early days of the school. It started in 86, and uh, I was going to school at William Patterson at that time. But okay. I remember coming to hang around the school this very first year, which was just Arnie Lawrence and uh, David uh, Levy, who was a dean here at Parsons, and he kind of started the school with Arnie. And I think there were like 15 students Larry Golings was one I knew him from before, 
So uh, I used to come and hang around on, on Fridays when I didn't have uh, classes out there in my, at, at William Patterson. So I was around for the very early days okay. of, of the new school. But I was a student here officially a couple of years later, 88, 89. Okay. So, okay. So you, I mean, you met a lot of, I mean, a lot of the guys that I would consider to be, you know, household jazz names today. Like you said, Larry Goldings. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Um, you uh, did, did met Brad Meldow when he here? came in a couple of years later. I think he came in '89. His okay. last year was uh, my last year was his first year. Yeah, we crossed paths. Yeah, uh -huh. but yeah, he came through, and uh, Jesse Davis was here, and Bill Stewart. Yeah. Bill Stewart never went here. He no? was at, I knew him from William Patterson. William I went, Patterson. I went okay. there for a year. That's a school out there in New Jersey. Okay. But, uh, yeah, the new school is an exciting place because of the students, but more so because of who Arnie got to come around and, and teach. You know, it was just like Arnie was not an educator. He was one of the players. And this school being in New York, the whole idea was of, of Arnie's was to have New York be the, the, the school, you know. So Arnie brought in all kinds of people, and you know, Tommy Flanagan was around. Jackie Byard was here early on. Chico Hamilton, all those guys were, were from the very beginning. But he brought in Jim Hall, and uh -huh. those were people that were around consistently teaching classes. Donald Byrd, yeah, um, Kenny Werner, and uh, but and then there was uh, he would just bring people for master classes, and I saw Art Blakey here, Roy Haynes. Wow. He brought Etta, Etta Jones and. So many, I mean, everybody came through, Billy Higgins. I mean, Arnie just would, he was, you know, he was on the scene. So he would just run into people and say, will you come to my school and meet my students on Friday? And that was the day, you know. And I remember the early days of the school was just like, it was very loose. It just seemed like, okay, school today is Walter Davis Jr. telling stories about Bud Powell and Mark. <laughs> and that was, that was That's school. That's good education. That was the day, you know. But, I mean, it wasn't like, you know. But... You know, like I say, Arnie wasn't an educator. He was. He wanted to teach people about, you know, the spirit of the music. I mean, besides, of course, the vocabulary and the language and the feeling of it. But you know, and, and the notes. But but Arnie was really about the spirit of music and people playing together and that whole sense of community. And that's why I think he wanted to make a school so he could, you know, have a school that was imbued with that, uh, you know, priority. Mm -hmm. Not like, here's a bunch of scales and stuff you have to learn, but really about introducing people to all the personalities of the music and right. realizing that that's what the music is. It's all, you know, people Playing with strong... Together. Yeah, people with strong personalities working together with other people with strong personalities. And, it tends and, to be that way with musicians, right? Yeah. Strong personalities. <laughs> yeah, well, there's, but it's, it's the way, yeah, it's just the way that this chemistry, like anything else, it's a social experience, you know, so right. Arnie was very tuned into that. So, so how, did, how did you, you know, the, let's go back a few steps further. How did you actually end up deciding you're going to be a, a professional jazz musician? Well, I, I mean, I was focused on it uh, from about, I mean, I, I loved music from an early age and got into the guitar about 12, 13, played blues and rock and all that stuff like we all did, and then yeah. got into jazz about 15, 16, got to, uh, you know, have some great teachers like Attila Zoller and Gene Bertensini. I met him at this uh, summer jazz workshop in Rochester. I mean, my, my parents were very supportive in that I showed uh, real you know, dedication to it. I spent a lot of time doing it and it wasn't, you know, so they, they got behind me in terms of, you know, you know, taking me to hear music and, you know, helping me. They saw arrange. you practicing a lot. Yeah, and helping to arrange lessons with people and, and, you know, they, they helped me out. But when it came time to go to college, you know, uh, of course my dad re was realistic and said, you know, maybe you should go to college for something real. Uh -huh. Like a real, <laughs> this, you know, like a real job. Well, like you know, just that whole, that whole, and uh, you know, I I was resistant to that because at that point, you know, at sixteen, I was really seventeen. I was really, I really wanted to try. I'd been to that, to that, had some experiences playing with people, you know, and I knew that I had a lot to learn, but I really wanted wanted to be a part of it. And so I just dedicated myself to really trying to learn the language, learn my instrument as best I could, and and was so lucky to have great experiences with musicians my own age, but also being exposed to uh, some of the elders, which just, you know, mm -hmm. that was something that they had, they had a thing in their, in their playing, like a, just a seasoning, like it was just like, you know, you can feel like 
the instrument is just an extension of themselves. They just it's just something they talk right. with, you know. Right. And so that's what I was attracted to and just wanted to how do I get to the instrument, you know, to the point where it just it disappears completely, you know, where you can just kind of wow. express yourself with it. And that's that's, that's in, the goal. In, in, right. in different ways. I mean seeing Jackie Byard play and teach and just talk about music and trying to, you know, see what was inside his mind and Jim Hall and Jimmy Cobb, getting to meet all these incredible musicians who had different ways of communicating and talking about what they did, but like I say, it was the strength of their personality, you know. And in Jim Hall's case, like the strength of his ability to make everybody sound good, like he had this guitar right. class and he would come for all of us and it sounded good because he was playing. You right. And we would play with each other and that's how we really sounded. So, you know, he had some kind of lift, some kind of magic buoyancy that... Uh, I was just fascinated with that, but it wasn't like a school thing where you can put a question to someone like, "How do you make everybody else sound so good?" You know, it's a it's lifetime you of just hear well, happening. It's it's yeah, you 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 see someone able to elevate the music and and uh, you know transport you with with sound, but that's what it is, you know, basically on on the on the simplest level. But but that was something about, of course, you know, it was about the way he was able to accompany uh, people and make them sound better. It's just part of his knowledge of music and of that, of course, specific things, but it comes from a place of generosity, like really just wanting to make people sound good, mm -hmm. you know, and being supportive. So I just, I'm just saying that to illustrate that strength, a strong personality doesn't always mean, you know, someone who's got to be the center of attention. A strong right. personality is strong in support, strong in that. Right, you know, they, me, you know, me being a guitar player, of course, I've, I've watched lots of interviews with Jim Hall and yeah. all these, all these sort of things, and, and he, and he, he's, he appears to be like a very more, very humble, yeah. you know, more of a quieter soul. Is that very would you agree quiet, with that? Very quiet, very, uh, very gentle, you know, a gentle person. But all those things, you know, you can hear that in his playing, you know, yeah, passion and and intelligence, humor, and you know, lyricism. You know, he was he was definitely a poet. But he, you know, he had some, it was just amazing to watch him play and make him make that sound, like, right in front of you. You know, like, playing a tune and just, you know, the feeling, you know, the feeling uh, that came from the sound that he made. That was, that was just, and, and, you know, like I say, that was a very impressionable time. So we're getting, we're watching all these masters play and seeing that, you know, they're all different. They're all kind of playing to their strengths and their, mm -hmm. you know, individual qualities. But there's also something, uh, an awareness that makes them able to come together and play together. Like that was, you know, some more than others, mm -hmm. but, but, but that's the beauty of it, you know. It's like how people's personality manifest in their, in their playing. But so much of the so-called jazz experience is about social Connection. Uh, exactly. You know, when you see a jazz group playing, that's an example of human beings working together. You know, Interesting. not facelessly, not just like, you know, disappearing into a formula because every person in the band has to assert themselves. That's what your so called solo is. But people assert themselves even in an accompanying role and how a drummer will change the sound of a band or a bass player. I mean, all these things. Once we're kind of keyed into listening for these details, we see a whole world of social interaction going on when you see people play. For better or for worse, why does it work? Why does it not work? Right. You know, and, and it's like that's... <laughs> yeah, as in life, sometimes it doesn't work. Just like people working together yeah. trying to do anything. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, but when it happens, it's really it's, it's a social miracle as well as a, you know, a sonic miracle. Right. So, I mean, of course, it sounds good, but what goes into the making of those sounds? What goes into people being relaxed enough to express themselves in the context of a, of a group, of a greater, you know, a community. So, so jazz, jazz is a social music. I mean, 
in, in on this blog, on this podcast, we've yeah. talked about that a, a lot, and, and you're backing that up. You know, when you're t- when you're talking about that, of course, I'm thinking about all the amazing shows, you know, including you being involved, where I've been like, wow, why was that show so good? Mm-hmm. And it was because yeah. everybody was sharing, everybody was building each other up. I guess mm-hmm. you could say it was kind of like that that perfect community, you know, where people aren't necessarily fighting each other, but right. all, everybody's right. trying to work together. And I'm, I'm thinking about this... Uh, uh, recording uh, when, when I was uh, even younger, <laughs> and um, that really s- stuck out to me. This example it just popped in my head of uh, it, the West. Mo- it's actually when Kelly, Kelly Trio mm-hmm, with West, West Montgomery, yeah. and it's yeah. that uh, smoking at the half note. Sure. Um, the the two no blues. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it, at one point, when Kelly's taking a solo. And then all of a sudden, uh, Wes comes in at the top of the chorus and plays like some, uh, like almost like a dissonant little mm-hmm. like rhythmic feature, and and immediately yeah. like when Kelly comes in mm-hmm. and he starts, you know, just bouncing totally. off of it. Yeah. And it's I remember that was just a magical moment for me. Just be like, how did they do that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is. It's, it's telepathic, but it's yeah, it's sensitivity. You know, that's the thing. But yeah, that's one of you mentioned that tune because that tune, hearing that was like the thing that kind of got me into like whoa, jazz is another planet. You know, like I realized, because I've been into, you know, of course, Jimi Hendrix and going back from him to the blues guys and everything and was trying to, like many guitar players, deal with that that world, you know, the sound of the blues, <laughs> you know, the blues world. And uh, when I heard that record, that tune in particular, it said no blues. I'm like, okay, this is, and it sounds, it sounds like a blues. I was, yeah, I'm following the form, although I would, it, it was another dialects you know like yeah. i can tell it's a language but i don't know really what they're saying i don't know what they're doing i don't know what notes wes is playing i don't know what notes Witten kelly is playing I have no idea what paul chambers is how does he make a walking bass line what is what's that all about what's the what's the science behind that and then the feeling you know of just like you know cob and just how the rhythm section that that buoyancy that lift you know yeah but i could hear it was a blues but i was like i don't know what all those notes are there's other notes that's not the pentatonic scale. So right. I'm like, I gotta figure this out. I gotta figure this, I gotta figure out what they're saying. Like that, and that tune particularly, because it was something, you know, the blues was some kind of, I can relate to it on a, whatever, on a level, but again, and then I heard Charlie Parker too, it was like, what are those notes? What what are, what are those notes? Where do they come from? Right. What is that? Are those the, is that just the major scale? I was just trying to, I'm gonna figure out what's going on. And then you start to learn about chromaticism and chords that lead to other chords and I'm still in it I'm still trying to figure still that working on it, I'm right? still trying to figure that out like just like how that you know that architecture but that tune was really like a pivotal thing of like okay the blues is the the branch you leap off from you know I wouldn't say the blues is a branch but that's you know it's it's, it's kind of the, the springboard. Yeah, it's that's where you know that connects. But but jazz is like there's some other colors there, other f- flavors that I've never tasted, never seen. There's other senses being. Yeah. You know, so I was just like, I gotta try to figure this this out. Yeah, it's and a flavorful yeah. music. I mean, <laughs> well, that's just one way to put it. Yeah, I suppose. yeah. But but like you say, just the just the colors, just the flavors. It was also like you say about the interaction with those guys and the feeling of the music. It's like how it's how it's presented to you, not just the recipe from a book or something like that, but like the whole experience of being in that place and like here's someone gives you something to, to eat, you know, but right. it's not just it's not just your taste buds involved. It's your whole it's your whole thing, you know. So yeah. Well but every tune on that record is to me like a it's like a you know Yeah. It's it's, 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 it's a holy grail. It, it is, it is. It it's really amazing. is like the you know, and I still listen to it still hear new things in it and it's just like and then that and that to me is is one of the i mean it's you know i like other styles of music but the reason one of the biggest reasons why i love jazz more than anything is because there's always something new to be heard yeah. or discovered more details, you can play yeah. the same songs over yeah. and over and over again but there's always something new you're gonna find and that's what keeps me excited about it it's very true very true. Let me uh, switch gears just a little bit. Ask you, I guess it's a personal question. Okay. What, what are what's some of the most challenging aspects of being a professional jazz musician? You know what? You know, I think we all know what the good things are about mm-hmm. it. You know, if, if, for for in your case, you, you know, maybe yeah. traveling the world. For a lot of people, that's a dream. But what, what are what are some of the things that are challenging about it? Um, 
I, I don't know that I can, I mean, it's challenging because it's something that we care about a lot. It's not just like, this is my job, I'm going to go be a jazz musician, and then five o'clock comes and, whew, good, I can leave that being a jazz musician at work and come home and, you know, we don't, we're not, uh, you know, many people in many walks of life have that relationship with, with what their so-called job is. So, uh -huh. you talk, uh, I'm always saying, because you phrased the question, a professional jazz musician, right? Yes. So, so, yeah, obviously the same challenges exist that for any occupation, it's like remain employed, you know? Right. That's, you know, the challenge is to stay professional, so... In, in professional means someone's paying you to do it. So right. the challenge is to get <laughs> people to pay you to do it. Or, you know, but that's, I don't think that's, you, you know, I don't think there are challenges to being a jazz musician. I think that's a privilege to be, a, you know, to be able to devote your life, uh, you know, to this pursuit, to, you know, playing an instrument and trying to express yourself on it and speaking in this language and interacting with people and, drawing from whatever certain common repertoires of tunes and living in that world and writing your own tunes that's there's no challenges about that that's just a complete you're a fortunate person you know if you can do that wow the challenges of being a professional anything are are those professional challenges of just how to navigate in the world of course you know professional if you're a if you're a bus driver you're selling yourself I'm I'm a bus driver. Believe that I'm a bus driver. Give me the job and I'll get everybody where they need to go on the bus. You know, that's cool. With with music or anything creative, you have to say, this is what I'm, do you believe me as this? You know, this is, I'm selling something. It's a little different than people need to take the bus. They don't need to go listen to somebody play or right. go yeah. buy a painting or something. So you have to make them believe that, you know, you're enhancing their life in some small way and they have to believe that you know, you know, on some level, you're, it's, it's, a, it's a product for consumption, you know. So that's like, that's the sad reality of professional anything. There's, you're getting money in exchange for delivering something. That's about as cynical as I can be about it, but that's a reality. So if you can take that as realizing that that's part of it, and of course it's impossible. You're selling yourself, so it's not just something that you're indifferent to. It's... You know, if you're accepted, you feel accepted. If you're rejected, you feel rejected. So right. it's you. So that's the thing that it gives you something, but it, it, you know, it's difficult because you're invested in it. But what's the alternative? Not to be invested, not to care if you're good or getting better or if people seem to appreciate what you do. You know, if you don't care about it, then you just, you just drive the bus where you have to go and open the door and... But if even in, in that job, you could say, open the door and be like, I'm really happy that I'm getting people where they need to go and be friendly. And you could right. be the best driver, best right. bus driver. That you know, it's all about the feeling. one, the one that the one that the kids talk about years down the road. You yeah, know? <laughs> of course, make you, an impact. You're also a professional, so you have to not just about being friendly to people. You have to remain employed and have Get a the bus to done. drive. So, the, the the more I try to you know understand that on that level, then. It's just, it's, there's a challenge. You can't say, well, I'm a jazz musician. Someone should take care of me and give me things because, you know, why? Where does, the, you know, it's, it's an indifferent world. You know, the universe is a cold place. So <laughs> the fact that you can even, you know, pursue this is, you have to think of that as, I remember Jim Hall used to say, like, playing music is its own reward. You know, you don't do it for a reward. Mm -hmm. Playing music is the reward. Wow. And it was just like a wow. kind of thing he would toss off, and then, you know, it's just like you had to really think about it, because we're all just kind of, at that age, you know, students were just trying to learn how to play, and am I good, am I hip enough, am I what, let's see, I don't know, who's hip, who's not hip, and then he would start, you know, say something like that, and it kind of puts it in perspective, it's like, yeah, okay. Wow. You know, that's, you know. I love that. It's its own reward. Music However, is its own reward. Playing music is a, is a, you know, it's a chance to do it, it's like a privileged thing. However... If you have to pay rent, you can't, you know, just pay it with a song, you know. Right. I mean, maybe, well, some people can. <laughs> maybe your landlord would accept that and that's... Oh, I see. Yeah, no, they can't. You know, you can't just... Can I stay here if I sing to you, you know, or something like right. that? Right. It doesn't really work like that. So you have to make money. It's something. <laughs>
What advice would you give to this up-and-coming generation of jazz musicians? Well, if you were to give any. I, I don't know that, uh, hmm. I don't know that I mean I what cuz I mean recently I've been seeing some younger players and really in different kind of styles different senses of aesthetics different senses of uh you know what it means to be playing jazz right now some people are like really going back in the history and uh -huh. playing very you know very straight ahead trying to invest in that language like we were kind of at that age you know and still and still are you know and other people are kind of like well I don't really you know, I'm not really into, into learning tunes, and certain aesthetics of the music are rejected by people. You know, just like they were, you know, like how Dixieland Cats probably felt like the swing guys were th throwing out a lot of the things that made their, you know. So it's just kind of like, this is just the way it goes. I don't know, This I think this generation, like every generation, has a, a lot of talented people. Some of them are like, you know, really directed and really focused. Others... You know, I think every generation is the same. I think with this, uh, this, the difference now is that there's so much information available to people so that mm -hmm. there's, you know, it's kind of easier or not easier, but there's more precociousness in a way because of the access to information. But like I say, jazz is a social music, so it's not like you can just ingest information and then, you know, that's only part of it, you know. But I also see a lot of younger players, you know, really going to that up you know other place and really playing with each other writing their own music they're coming from a different place of like kind of like they're having a like a rock band or something like this is our stuff we play this stuff and like and a band it, band yeah and other guys are are kind of uh you know just want to play the standard standards from from the days of old and i just look at it like wow here come you know another bunch of guys that like you know now i'm the guy that sits around and like looks and say wow these some young dudes just like we used to feel like there's some old, you know, yeah, starting to be crusty guys kind of saying, yeah, you're the young guys, huh? You know, it's like, it's just like, <laughs> here it is. All of a sudden, it's like, you know. The tables have turned. So I don't know that they need any advice from me. I think that they just like, you know, the guys that are serious are going to be serious. And all you can, there's no, only advice you can be to a younger generation musician is to try to exemplify what the people you respected exemplify to you. You know, right. so that's, that's, you know, I, I definitely feel lucky that I had so many great teachers. I didn't just learn from, you know, like, uh, books and watching YouTube and stuff like that. Like, I was able to see a lot of great musicians and have a lot of great teachers and tell me important things. So I feel like, you know, I'm very lucky that I heard firsthand a lot of different opinions, a lot of different things, people questioning different, you know, Kind of like I'm, I remember when I was a student at Rutgers, uh, Kenny Barron was like, we we're playing some tune out of the real book, and the changes were all wrong. And Kenny Barron was like, "What? This is totally wrong," you know. So it was important at age eighteen to see like, "Wow, the real book's not right, not the, the Bible. Time. It's yeah. not totally. It's just a book that some guys wrote." I'm gonna check out Kenny Barron and say, "Yeah, I should go back to the record and see what's on," you know. So I was lucky to just have that, you know, interaction with people, and and so I try to like I like I say I just you know. I teach a lot, and I try to just tell students what, what I was told that really still resonates with me 20, 25 years later, like as, as the stuff that, 30 years later, that it was like the stuff that they should have been telling me, like they were right about that, you know? Right. Just, you know so that's, you know, that's all. I think it's just about, I don't think any young generation wants to hear advice from, you know, they just, they want to, look and see who they want to be like, you know, and, and you have to try to exemplify. Real model. Yeah, you have to exemplify what's important to you, and if somebody comes along and finds, you know, but like I say, like, what we were exposed to was just many great individuals, strong personalities, so that's, that's what it's about. You have to try to, that's everyone's, you know, process is to get to themselves, you know, and that's, you know, that's a life, that's a lifelong journey, you know, so. Beautiful.
Yeah, man. So tell me quickly, well, as mm-hmm. we close out, tell okay. me all about your new, new your new album. Um, it's uh, came on came out on the Smoke Sessions. Yeah. Uh, you know, I go way back with with smoke and before it was smoke it was augie so that's uh-huh. kind of a place where we had kind of really came together and learned how to play and going back with like jesse davis and larry goldings and bill stewart and joe farnsworth and eric alexander and then those guys really brought in the elders cecil payne and harold mayburn and people like that so that's kind of a hallowed ground for me that place and and uh and now paul is uh doing this paul stash is doing this label and he's recording a lot of great people so Gave me a chance to do the record, and uh, yeah, I was able to get Bill Stewart and Doug Weiss and Gerald Clayton, uh-huh. and uh, we did mostly my tunes, I think five of my tunes, and just tried to mix it up a little bit, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad it's out there. It's, you know, if you write tunes and they sit around too long, they, you know... They start to they, fester Yeah, you know, so I'm just <laughs> glad to... Well, get them it, out it's, it's a fantastic it. album. I've oh, listened thanks, to man. it. Uh, if uh, you, you know, if you're listening, uh, you want to get this album, you really should. All the music in the show today is from Peter's new album. Uh, where can we find that CD, baby, Peter? I would think so. Yes. Okay. I know uh, you can you can order it from Amazon. I'm sure. That. Amazon, and iTunes, yeah. CD, baby. Look up yeah. Peter Bernstein. Yeah. Let loose. Smoke sessions. Yeah. All right, well, Peter, thanks so much for uh, oh. taking the time today. We enjoyed having you. Uh, you it was an honor to get to talk to you, and just thanks a lot for your time. Thank you, Brent. Appreciate it. All right, and that's all for our show today. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, I know one of my biggest, I mean, there's a lot of takeaways, but one of my biggest takeaways from today's talk was uh, the Jim Hall thing that Peter uh, was referring to when, when, when Jim says that playing music is its own reward. It, it, I love that. Playing music is its own reward. That's so great. Uh, there's, I'm sure, I'm sure all of you got a lot out of this today too, and, and I'd love to hear from you. So, you know, if you're on the website right now, leave us a comment. Uh, love to hear what you have to say about today's episode. If you have anything to add onto what we talked about today, that would be great. So leave us a comment and remember you can get, uh, Peter's new album, Let Loose, find it on iTunes, find it on Amazon.com. Just look up Let Loose, Peter Bernstein. You'll find it there so you can purchase that. Uh, and remember, if, if you got any value out of today's show, consider adding value back. Um, you can support this podcast if you're on the website by clicking the support button below. Um, and if you're not on the website, go to learnjazzstandards.com slash support. And you can help us out there. And next week, we're going to be coming out with episode number 13 of the LJS podcast. We're looking forward to seeing you then. (laughs) 